Well, good morning, everybody. So great to be with you. Uh, thanks so much for coming to church, especially you who I can see here, but actually not especially, especially you who I cannot see uh, at the Torrance campus. So glad to be connecting live with everybody over at Torrance. And then anybody watching this online, thanks for being here. Uh, I don't actually think I said, my name is Alex Grom, and uh, I'm the Torrance campus pastor. Great to be with you all this morning. Uh, today, uh, for our series, we're starting a brand new series of messages uh, called Finding Home in the Unknown. And we are entering a new era of biblical history for those of you who have been tracking with us as we've kind of been tr- looking at the entire narrative of Scripture. In the Old Testament, we are about to enter one of the darkest eras of uh, the story of God's people, the Israelites, in the Old Testament. And it's called this uh, it's called the Exile. Uh, For hundreds of years, God had been warning his people that if they didn't keep the covenant promises that they had made to each other, that God was going to send a consequence. And the exile is that confidence come to pass where God allows foreign nations to come in and wipe out uh, the nations of Israel and Judah, carry them off into captivity, into exile uh, for a period of time to draw them back to him, to turn their hearts back to him. Uh, It is a Uh, a scary time. Now, I know in the past we've talked about other dark times in biblical history, but this really was the lowest of low uh, because these people were now captives in a foreign country, and they found themselves asking a very important question that God wants to help them answer, and he wants us to be able to answer as well because he knows that sometimes we struggle with it. Here's the question we're going to be tackling maybe for the whole series. How do I follow God when the world around me is so broken? Have you felt this way maybe about our culture, about the place that you live, where you want to live for God, you want to live in a certain way, but culture seems to be falling apart around us. We seem, we feel sometimes like we are strangers in a strange land, like we are looking for home in the unknown. Uh, Now, this week, this reminded me of uh, a time in my past where I was literally looking to find home. Uh, We made a big move in our family. Have you ever made a big home move? Those are always stressful. I know that many of you have. Uh, I I know I've told you this many times before, but about seven years ago, my family moved from Minnesota to Southern California for this job. And it There is no amount of explanation or people trying to give us the prep for the biggest difference between Minnesota and Southern California. Can you guess what it is? Not the weather, the housing. That's right, the housing costs that we had out here. We could not believe it. For the first year that we were in town, uh, we rented a uh, single-family home. And it almost killed us uh, because our money was just flying out of, uh, and there's no place the money went. It just went away. Uh, And we knew pretty quickly we would not survive that kind of rental situation. And so we made a quick move just one year in. Uh, I looked everywhere, and praise the Lord, I was able to find a smaller uh, but much more affordable apartment. And so... Uh, It was a stressful time for us as we were trying to find our way here in Southern California, but praise the Lord, we were able to uh, make this small move. It was just a one-mile move to an apartment. Best part was that our kids got to stay in the same school district, so we didn't start them and then one year later transfer them elsewhere. But we were already stressed out, knowing we needed downsize, and so my wife and I, we pooled all of our resources to give ourselves a little bit of a blessing in the fact that we hired the movers. Have you hired the movers? It's wonderful. Instead of calling our friends and giving them pizza, we got the big burly guys with the truck to come uh, and load up all our stuff, drive one mile, and then try to unload. Um, So that day arrived. Finally, the day arrived of the move. And you know, it's kind of hard to leave that first place where we landed, Uh, but the, the guys were there. They were loading up all of our stuff into the truck, and I took my older son, his name is Martin, over to the new apartment uh, in order, you know, just to open the windows, kind of get the place ready for the furniture that was about to arrive. Uh, So we were there maybe about half an hour early. Uh, The windows are open, air is moving through the new apartment. Standing in the living room there, some of you have heard this story, but standing in the living room there, my 12-year-old Martin all of a sudden he starts making weird noises and kind of jumping around and slapping his legs and going like, yow, yow, uh," and I didn't know what was going on. He was a middle schooler. He was freaking out. That's kind of common for middle schoolers, so I wasn't sure if he was just being a weirdo. It turns out he was not just being a weirdo. Um, He was uh, trying to get the hundreds of fleas off of his legs that were jumping up from the carpet onto his legs. Turns out that this new apartment we were moving in, the completely carpeted new apartment we were moving into, was infested with fleas. Do you have that at your house? I hope you don't have that at your house. 
It was a terrible moment. Now, actually, I want to jump ahead in the story to let you know everything worked out. <laughs> we juggled our stuff uh, that was on the truck already. We stayed somewhere else for a week. My new landlord was unbelievably embarrassed and ran over and fumigated and did all these treatments. And we have uh, lived there now for six years, completely flea-free, without fleas for six years, uh, still praying every day that that will continue for many years to come. <laughs> uh, but now, okay, so that's the good part of the end of the story. But I do want to bring us back to rewind to that moment where I was feeling all of the bad things that you can feel. Like. I was feeling frustrated. I was feeling lost. I was feeling confused. This place that we were supposed to settle was absolutely intended to be our home, and we were completely unmoored from that. I had no sense of, will this be a safe place? Will this be where the future lands? Will this be what God has for us? I, I literally had no more money <laughs> to solve the problem, and all of my earthly possessions were in a truck coming my way, needing to be unloaded <laughs> somewhere. I remember standing there watching my kid slap his legs uh, and feeling the itch myself and just feeling like I had no hope. I had no plan. I had no money. I had no sense of what the next step was. I can tell you that it was a dark time for me. That moment of flea realization, fleealization, was, was such a powerful one uh, that I look back at where I, I legitimately did ask that question of the series, how do I follow God when the world around me is so broken, where there are places like fleas that can upset an already stressful situation. I, I just, I, I remember that moment where I said, Lord, I'm trying to find home and I don't know where I'm going. I don't know what you have for me. I, I feel a little bit lost here. Not a little bit lost. I, that was a low point uh, for me. The, the beauty of this series that we're in is that God's people, the Israelites, are asking this question and God responds to them. He teaches them. He shows them answers to this question. He brings them hope and a future. And so I actually want to turn this into a positive main idea for today that we're going to learn about together. Here it is. Uh, we can find and connect to God even as we make our home in the unknown. In those moments where things go so terribly wrong in your life, in those moments where you don't know what the next step is, when things have crumbled around you, we can still connect and find God in those situations. He still loves you. He is with you. He wants to show you that. In fact, I'm so glad that we are entering this kind of main idea series right now for where we are in our culture. Because the next 10 days of our time living in this culture is likely to be tumultuous. 50% uh, of us, two weeks from now, will have the guy, the person, the, whoever in the office that we'd not necessarily want in the office. You know what I mean? We, we will be voting, and statistically, we will be a place that has a little more stress uh, and more 50% divisions than we've had in the past. It, it is a time for us to, as we're feeling a little bit untethered, to listen to the lessons that God wanted to teach his people uh, back during the exile. So today, we're really going to center on one chapter of the Bible. It comes from a book of the Bible called Jeremiah, and then chapter 29. So if you have your Bibles and you want to flip there, we'll get to this section in just a bit. This section is written by a prophet of God named Jeremiah. That was his job. His call as a person was to hear from God messages and then to share those messages with God's people. That was Jeremiah's place. He lived in about the year 600 B.C. That's when he wrote this section of his book. Uh, and so as we look at it today, that year 600 is going to be pretty important. In fact, it takes some backstory to understand the situation that he was in. Um, like I said, we've been walking through together as a church, if you're new with us, what we're calling the story project, which is from the beginning to the end of the Bible, kind of the arc of the narrative. What is the story, the grand story and themes of the Bible? Um, a few eras back in our exploration of ancient history, we were looking at something called the unified kingdom. This was the highlight of God's people, the Israelites, and their connection with him. This is when they were the most devoted to him, and they were one nation that had a couple great kings, famous kings like King David and King Solomon that we read together about. 
Now, unfortunately, that season, that highlight season, didn't last all that long because after the death of Solomon, there was so much internal tension in the nation of Israel that they ended up dividing. So that's the first date I want to put up here. In about 970 BC, Israel and Judah, God's people, who were supposed to be in covenant relationship with them, actually split into two nations. We call that the divided kingdom era. During that era, there were ups and downs of kings in both uh, dynasties and mostly bad kings to the point where they kept leading the people of God away from him towards other nations' gods, towards false idols and, and, and abandoning the God that had rescued them many years before. During that season of the divided kingdom, God kept sending prophets and saying, listen, you have made covenant promises to me. I have made covenant promises to you. If you don't turn back to me, I'm going to send a major consequence. I'm going to allow foreign nations to conquer you in war. The Israelites wouldn't listen. And eventually, God allowed that consequence to come to pass. And that season, is that that era of time is called the exile. So, in 1720 BC, the exile began. It was actually the superpower at that time, Assyria, that swept in and completely wiped out the northern kingdom of Israel. A a good chunk of God's people were scattered to the wind in the destruction of their nation as they abandoned God. It was absolutely horrible. Um, the, The southern kingdom called Judah, where Jerusalem was, lasted a little bit longer. They did a little bit better, but not much. Uh, because in, here in this uh, section, the next one, in 587, 586 BC, Babylon, the newest superpower on the scene, actually goes through, wipes out Assyria, and then also wipes out in phases all of Judah and its capital city of Jerusalem. It was a horrific battle event. I mean, not just one battle, but many, many years of horrific war uh, and suffering as these people received this consequence from God. The Babylonians, as they swept through, um, took everyone in the city captive in phases. Um, And either those people went to live in some place in the Babylonian Empire in squalor, in encampments, or they were recruited recruited to serve the Babylonian government to support the empire to make it stronger. So everyone who had lived in safety in Jerusalem and in Judah was shipped off in phases into this foreign nation. They were exiled there. Now I want, as we read over the next few weeks, we're going to read stories about those people in exile. I want us to connect with how that must have felt. These people were literally uh, battle ravaged and torn from their homes and put into a new land where they did not want to be. In their homeland, they had worshipped one God, one loving God, whereas now they were in in Babylon, the people of Babylon worshipped many gods, a pantheon of gods, and many of them were erratic and wicked. Um, In their homeland, in Israel, they had been focused on family and connectedness and community. Babylon was focused on progress and conquest. It was a different aim in that. You can tell, you can see how they would be out of place. Uh, In their own country, of course, they had been in the majority. They had been able to set the way that they were going to live, where in Babylon, they were obviously the persecuted minority in that place. Have you ever felt like those people in exile? Have you ever felt out of place, dragged from where you want culture to go, where you want the world to head, and now you feel like the place around you is falling apart? Some of you may have even expressed that, whether that's political views or just the sense that culture is going in a direction that God is not a fan of. I want to tell you that you're not that far off. Now, I'm glad that we haven't been taken captive in other places, but I do want us to see that there is a resonance in some of this discomfort that maybe you've been feeling in our culture and the lessons that we can learn from these ancient Israelites. I want to read to you, it's not quite in Jeremiah 29, thanks for turning there, we're not quite there yet. Uh, I want to read to you a psalm. We have one of the, a beautiful poem in the Bible from the perspective of these captive Israelites, and it's really powerful, so let me read it to you. It says this, beside the rivers of Babylon, we sat and we wept as we thought of Jerusalem. We put away our harps, hanging them on the branches of poplar trees, for our captors demanded a song from us. Our tormentors insisted on a joyful hymn, sing us one of those songs of Jerusalem. But how can we sing the songs of the Lord while in a pagan land? 
These people wanted to be motivated to worship God, to praise him, but the world around them was so foreign, so non-home to them that they asked that question, how do we sing the songs of the Lord in this foreign place? Some of you might have felt like that. Now in this, we read this of course in English nowadays, it was originally written in ancient Hebrew, and there's something that we don't get to see as well in our English translations. But look, I highlighted the words, we, our, us. These words all have in the ancient Hebrew a, a, a word form that ends with N-U. So it ends with this sound of like nu, nu. The, when you read this poem in ancient Hebrew, there is that repeated ooh, 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 where it's written specifically to have a rhythm of groaning to it, of, of, a, of a mourning that's inherent in the text here audibly as they would read this beautiful poem to one another. These sounds of groans, even within their poetry, they are moaning and groaning. It's a time of great discomfort for these people. Have you felt a time of great discomfort? If you are, if you have, you need to be studying the exile because despite their moaning, despite their grieving, God was with them and God had something to say to them. In fact, I do wanna jump now to Jeremiah 29. It starts with an incredibly important thing for us to read. If you are feeling like you're in exile right now, let me read you how it starts. Jeremiah talking. Jeremiah wrote a letter from Jerusalem. He is actually stuck at this point in the city of Jerusalem as it's being besieged by the Babylonians. The Babylonians have already come in and taken many people captive, but Jeremiah himself as a prophet is still stuck in the embattled city. During that battle, he hears a message from the Lord. So Jeremiah wrote a letter from Jerusalem to the elders, the priests, the prophets, and all the people who had already been exiled to Babylon by King Nebuchadnezzar. This is what the Lord of heaven's armies, the God of Israel, says to all the captives that he has exiled to Babylon from Jerusalem. Now we're gonna stop there <laughs> because I'm not, we're gonna pause. I'm not even gonna read you yet what the text of the message from God is because right here, this is vitally important for what's happening in our culture. If you were living in a country, in a nation that you thought was God's kingdom and then the foreign invaders of Babylon came and wiped it out, it would be understandable, I think, for you to think, God has abandoned us. God is no longer here. Our sin has reached such a peak that God has left us. The very existence at that moment of Jeremiah hearing a message from God that he is to share with the exiled people is such a miracle. Because it's at that exact moment, that perfect need moment, that God says, you are not alone. I have not abandoned you. I am home for you. He says, I see you. I want you to know I still love you and I'm with you. That's so vital for us to know today. In fact, I wanna make that our first point. If you're feeling like you're in the unknown, you need to remember that God is still with us in this world that is not our home. Right now, no matter how stressed, no matter how different culture it goes, what direction and far from God it may take, that God is still here with us. He sees you. He loves you. He wants to be connected to you. In fact, I don't want you just to believe that. I think that there is a response that we can have if you're a person who follows Jesus that goes beyond just receiving that ourselves. I think we are called to be the Jeremiah's in this culture right now. That it's, it's a mighty miracle that God gave them this gift of a prophet to tell them, the people of Israel, that God still was with them. The people in your neighborhoods, the people in your life need that message as well. So let me give you this as one of our most important action steps. I want you to find a way to remind someone that God is with them this week. Now you're not gonna be an ancient prophet that gets your words in the Bible, but you can be a Jeremiah to someone who needs to hear God is with you in fact, in some ways, he has sent me <laughs> to tell you that, how much he cares about you. Here I am, let's connect with him. Let's find him in the unknown, but let's be his ambassadors in a dark place. Now, Jeremiah goes on to actually give some of the content of this message from God. Let me read that to you. Uh, again, this is what the Lord of Heaven's armies, the God of Israel, says to all the captives he has exiled from Babylon to Jerusalem. God says to them, build homes. Plan to stay, 
Plant gardens, eat the food they produce. Marry, have children, then find spouses for those children so that you may have many grandchildren. He goes on like this, multiply, don't dwindle away, and work for the peace and prosperity of the city where I sent you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, for its welfare will determine your welfare. This is both a comfort and an absolute shock to those people of God who received this in exile. They thought, oh good, God is with us. He has a message. He's going to get us out of here. He's gonna smite these evil Babylonians. Is that what God says? No, God says, settle in. Not only that, pray and be a blessing for the promotion of the Babylonian city where you live. It's an incredibly stark message from God that goes exactly against thematically where a lot of us have become heart practice. We have been practicing a different mode of living that is very negative, and that is this. We are very into this idea, us versus them. This is our favorite thing nowadays. We might not admit it, but we love it when it's someone else who's the bad guy. We say, well, at least it's not us. I'm doing things right. We're safe as long as we huddle tightly enough together. Maybe they will ruin everything because they're the bad guys. That is not at all how God operates in this passage from Jeremiah. In fact, this, this idea of the walls we put up of us versus them, to me, most crystallized in, uh, in an old show. Maybe you've seen this show, Lost. Is anybody else a Lost fan here watch? Okay, even whistling, that's great. Um, if you haven't seen it, it's an old show. When was it from? The 2000s? Whoa, that's long. Okay, well, anyway, a, a lot of these people were in a plane crash in the show and survived the plane crash, and now they're on a deserted island, and the whole show takes place on this mysterious deserted island, except they find out pretty quickly it's not all that deserted. So they're trying to survive and find rescue, and then in the woods, in the tree line, are these like mysterious bad guys, other people. In fact, they label them something very specific in the show. Can you remember what they label them? They label those outdoor, out there mysterious bad people as, something very simple, as the others. They say, well, it's not us out there. It's just someone, something nefarious. Something is out there. The others are the bad guys. I can't tell you how much that resonates with how we often in our culture talk about one another. Well, if we just, if we just create systems where I can, I can do all of my life and connected with the safe people, then I don't have to deal with all those others. In fact, they're ruining everything out there. We love this idea of others. Now, I want to put back up on the screen that section from Jeremiah. How does our desire to put up barriers between us and them to label people as others, how does that survive a passage like this where God says to them, pray to the Lord for the city that I've sent you to. Their welfare will determine your welfare. In, in God's view, there are no others he loves everybody. Those people who you disagree with absolutely the most are the people who need you as God's ambassador the most. Yes, you might feel like we live in a dark and scary place, and unto that dark and scary place, God has sent you. He has sent you with his love. He has sent you with his spirit. And he says, pray for those people. Pray for the city you live in. Bring peace and prosperity in any way you can. In fact, I want to put that as our second point. God wants us to tear down the walls of us versus them. It's damaging. It's negative. It's unhelpful. It's unchristlike. He wants us instead to reach our neighbors, to share love with people we disagree with. He wants your kids playing on the same flag football teams as everybody else. He wants you to be on that same PTA committee team meetings that you have to go to. He wants you working right next to that guy who's in the cubicle next to you who drives you bananas. He wants you in that family of wackos that you're gonna see again at Thanksgiving and there's a lot of them that are gonna cause trouble. Maybe that's more concerning to you than the election. Um, we live in a world where God has said, I get it, this is a broken place, but you are my people, I love you, and I have put you there so that you might bring peace and prosperity at op any opportunity you have. In fact, this week, here's the action step for this point. This week, recognize and release 
one us versus them impulse and then replace it with positive prayer and maybe even help. This will not be hard, at least the first half of this will not be hard because you will have an us versus them impulse in the next 10 days. This week, you will see a sign, you will fall backwards into a conversation, you will read something online, an article, and you'll be like, ooh, us versus them, it will rise up in you. Recognize that moment and say, wait a minute, those people are not my enemy, those people are loved by God. He died for them. He wants me to love them and pray for their success even. How could this be? But I will do it. I guarantee you that would, this action step will be the most uncomfortable thing you do this week and the most Christ-like if you're a follower of Jesus. One more thing. I don't want us to miss this ending here. One of the most famous verses of the Bible comes from this next section of Jeremiah. Jeremiah goes on. This is what the Lord said. You will be in Babylon for 70 years. But then... I will come and I'll do for you all the good things I have promised. I will bring you home again. Then he says, "For the I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. They're plans for good, not for disaster, to give you a future and a hope. In those days when you pray, I will listen. He goes on like this. If you look for me wholeheartedly, you will find me. I will be found by you, says the Lord. I will end your captivity, restore your fortunes. I will gather you out of the nations where I sent you and bring you home again to your own land. It is such a gracious gift to these exiles in this ancient time that he gives them a timeline. He says, this is hard, but it's not forever, 70 years. I wish the Lord would give us such a clear timeline. He does not do that. (laughs) Interestingly, 70 years is about what any of us have right? And if you don't feel at home, good news, in about 70 years, if you're a Jesus follower, you'll be home with him. (laughs) I don't know if that's comforting because I'm telling you about like, just get to death and you'll be fine. That's not a great message. That's not, we, we are not meant to just grit our teeth and bear this life and say, Lord, finally you will take me to your eternal kingdom when I die. 70 years, Lord. That's not how we're supposed to operate. Instead, we're supposed to say, okay, but for those 70 years, I'm going to believe you have plans for me, that you have hope-filled, future-filled plans for me, Lord. In fact, in this sentence, especially this top one, he gives it to us very clear. For the next 70 years, may you live that long, you are intended to do this thing. You are intended to never stop looking for God wholeheartedly. He says, seek me with your whole heart. If you are new to exploring faith, You've just begun that journey. I want to tell you, you are in exactly the right spot to do this, to seek after God wholeheartedly. Keep coming on Sundays. Even think about volunteering with us or being part of a group with us so you can explore these ideas of faith and who Jesus could be in your life. If you seek God wholeheartedly, remember his promise from that verse was, he will be found by you. You will find God by seeking after him. If you're a person who's maybe been a person of faith for a long time, you've been following Jesus with everything you can for a long time, the message is the exact same for you. Keep going. It's it's a challenge of resilience, of saying, Lord, every day I'm going to follow you. I'm not just gonna wait until the next Sunday where I get to hear them mention a few verses on a screen. I'm going to explore the word, the Bible. I'm going to dig into who you are, God. I'm gonna meet with others and talk about how I can do better at living for you, be inspired by your spirit. We need to every day seek after God wholeheartedly. I've got one last challenge before we close, but let's look at what we talked about today. Today, we said we can find We can connect to God even as we make our home here in the unknown. How? Well, we need to remember that God is still with us in this world. That is not really our home. Second, we need to tear down the walls of us versus them. And then finally, never stop looking for God wholeheartedly. Uh, Here at the end, as I conclude, (laughs) I just want to call out the fact that I I have just spent 25 minutes presenting a pretty bleak view of our culture (laughs) and society And in some ways, I want to say that feels very appropriate. And on the other side of my mouth, I want to tell you, that's not how we're supposed to live. That's not how I live my life, and you should not either. If we live in a dark place, if this is not our home, God's our home, and he's with me, he's with you right now. And we have opportunities together 
to rewrite the story of what the end of 2024 is gonna look like for us. When I look at what the culture thinks the end of 2024 is gonna look like for us, it's pretty miserable. (laughs) But I think when I think of what God wants us to be doing, he wants us to be doing exactly what Jeremiah described, bringing peace, prosperity, uh, gentleness, kindness to the people around us in a way that people would say, hey, I wanna know the God that you follow. I don't think it's accidental that we just got done with the Feed My Starving Children week. I know many of you volunteered at both campuses for that. Thank you for that. Um, Some of you know that got moved to fall because Torrance collapsed. (laughs) Remember that? Uh, It was supposed to be in the spring. We had to move it to fall to fix Torrance in time to do it. I don't think that's an accident from the Lord. He helped us kick off a season here at church where there will be many opportunities for us to serve him, to give back to the community, to share hope with the world. In the next couple weeks, you're gonna hear about opportunities to uh, do, be part of a food drive where we collect food for people in need in our own community. Then after that, we're gonna do a Christmas present drive, adopt a family where we help people who may not be able to celebrate with gifts feel God's love by giving them some wonderful things as a church. We're gonna have an opportunity to serve uh, people in the foster, kids in the foster care uh, system who we're gonna celebrate uh, by a big Christmas party with them, bringing them a little bit of hope. We're gonna do all of these things, not just because we wanna spin our wheels and try to be nice people. We're gonna do those things because we wanna share the love of Jesus. So the final action step I have for you in all of this is be all in on our holiday season opportunities for serving and generosity. When these things come, sign up for every single one of them. <laughs> And then come up with eight more together of what you're going to do personally or in your family. Let's make the end of the year of 2024 a season of delight, of joy, of peace and prosperity that we're going to start here as a church and share that with the people in our community who are living in the unknown. That's God's call for us today. Thanks so much for listening. Uh, Can I close by asking you to stand with me? We're going to close in prayer before we're dismissed. At both campuses, if, if you'd like to spend an extra five minutes, if you need to have a conversation with someone, uh, right over here on this side of uh, both rooms is a cross that's lit up on the wall. Um, there will be some great staff and volunteers over there. We'd love for you to stop by. They would be willing to talk with you, to pray with you, to pray uh, for you, um, whatever you need before you go today. All right, let's, will you bow with me and we'll pray to close. Dear Jesus, thank you for your call in our lives. Thank you that you recognize and you know that there, are, there is some dark elements to the world that we live in, and yet, Lord God, you're not scared by dark elements. Um, you, are, you are a God of light and hope and life, and, and help us through your Holy Spirit to experience that this week. Lord, send us out of um, these buildings in order to serve you um, and bring hope to people around us. Thank you, Lord God, for calling us to that. Thank you for giving us this place and an opportunity uh, to see the world the way you see it. We we love you and we want to pray all of these things in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thanks so much for coming to church, everybody. We'll see you next Sunday.